Hey guys, it's your Peacekeeper coming at you with the next video in our How to Play series on the Japanese Destroyer Lines. And this is the Tier 6 Fubuki class of destroyers. There were 24 of the Fubuki class destroyers completed between 1926 and 1932. They are divided up into three types of Fubuki class destroyers, the Type 1 class being based around the original design for Fubuki, the Type 2 is based on Ayanami, and the Type 3 is based on the Akatsuki that we see at Tier 7. The Fubuki class is widely considered to be the first modern destroyer design of the world. And as a result, she was called a special type destroyer by the Japanese due to the massive increase in performance of the class over preceding destroyers. The original design called for a 2,000 ton displacement with a single 5 inch main battery and two twin 24 inch torpedo tubes while being capable of 40 knots. When the Washington Naval Treaty was abandoned in 1923 by the Japanese, the design added more guns and more torpedo tubes to give her the form that we see, well, on Akatsuki, really, uh, um, that included the three twin 5-inch gun mounts and three triple 24-inch torpedo tubes. The resulting destroyer, though, had some issues, and those would not be fixed until the issues were discovered when the Japanese torpedo boat Tomozuru capsized in heavy seas. The class had to go through some strengthening of the whole configuration as well as ballasting of it in order to get the ships to actually have decent bad weather performance, and as a result, the ships went from being 1,750 long tons in displacement to 2,050 long tons of displacement, completely empty, and up to 2,400 tons with a full combat load. In early 1945, the surviving Fubuki-class destroyers did have their X turret, that's this middle one here, that is missing on ours in-game. It was replaced with additional 25mm AA guns, and then they also added additional 13mm AA guns and radar, in addition to more depth charges at that time. In terms of service history, it's important to note that only two of these ships actually survived World War II, that being Hibiki, which was given to the Russians as a prize of war, and was renamed Verni, which means faithful, and Ushio, which was surrendered to the Allies and then scrapped in 1948. These destroyers were used for dozens of uses throughout the wars, many of them participating in Tokyo Express runs, others participated in various famous naval battles such as the First and Second Naval Battles of Guadalcanal, Battle of Bismarck Sea, the Battle of Midway, the Invasion of the Aleutian Islands, and the Battle of the Solomon Islands, and the Battle of Leyte Gulf. And as you can imagine, it is extremely difficult to pick just one of these ships to talk about the heroic acts of the crew or the funny acts of the crew to really talk about them. And so I'm not going to, to pick out one of them to talk about. And if I were to pick one of them, we're going to cover it with the Tier 7 Akatsuki anyway when we get to Akatsuki here in a couple weeks. So I, I won't dive into that for this one anyway. In terms of her in-game gameplay performance, for those of us who remember the Fubuki of, of yore with the three hole configurations, the last two being the two most commonly used, this will kind of... Uh, it makes you want to grit your teeth because they forced us into the anti-aircraft hole, which was that final hole upgrade, where we lost one of our gun turrets out back and gained the additional anti-aircraft capabilities. And really, it's not the best hull configuration for this class of ships. And it is so obvious when you play Akatsuki or Shinonome, which is the tier 6 premium that you get for completing the campaign. I forget which campaign it is. It's the harder of the two campaigns. Um, you, you really notice it. And the additional AA doesn't help the ship at all. I mean, it's got reasonably good AA, which we'll talk about when we get to the stats. But overall, it just... Ah, it just frustrates me. And the reduction the, the reduction in tier from tier 8 to tier 6 means we lost that detection decreasing module, that concealment systems mod 1, that brought the detection range down to a really short 5.4 kilometers. And 
Both of those things kind of hurt the ship a little bit, but you know, really what happened was is it brought it into line with other Tier 6 destroyers and the expectations placed upon them. She still packs nine extremely powerful torpedoes in three triple launchers, and she's still very maneuverable and for a Tier 6 destroyer, still very stealthy. Of of course, losing those two guns and not having the same range means that we also lose out on the artillery side of things, and that really does hurt her, but she more than makes up for it with her torpedo gameplay. Let's dive into the stats. She has 12,900 hit points, next to no armor as we've come to expect from destroyers. Uh, her main battery consists of two... Twin 5-inch 50 caliber guns. They have a 10-kilometer main battery firing range and an 8-second reload time, and the turrets turn a glacial 30 seconds. But she does shoot them out at 915 meters per second, which means they do get there reasonably quick. 10-kilometer max range on those, which is interesting also that that is also your main range for your torpedoes. Speaking of, you have three by three, so nine total in three triple launchers, 610 millimeter, 24 inch torpedoes. They go 10 kilometers at a speed of 59 knots. They do 16,267 damage when they get there, and their detection range is 1.5 kilometers. So very good torpedoes for this tier. They are a touch slow, and if you wanted to run torpedo acceleration on this ship, you could get away with it. It would drop your torpedoes down to 8 kilometers, and you would go get up to 64 knots. But ultimately, I don't really feel it's necessary, because with Fubuki, you can place torpedoes up against ships to the, where they can't avoid them. You can create massive walls of torpedoes that guarantee dev strikes if you place them right, and that takes a lot of skill to get to that point. Your torpedoes do reload in 76 seconds, which, to be quite honest with you, it... it that feels about right. I mean, they come up often enough that you can actually use them, and it's not like you're handicapped if you don't. Well, yeah, you are handicapped if you don't. Don't <laughs> ignore what I just said there. Um, you do definitely need to use the torpedoes, and the best time to use them and the des best distance we'll cover in the battle video. In terms of anti-aircraft defense, uh, you can see she has four single 13 millimeters, two double 13 millimeters, 15 single 25 millimeters, one double 25 millimeter, and four triple 25 millimeter Type 96 machine guns. Her AA suite pokes out to 3.1 kilometers. And, uh, you know, there's a fairly decent amount of DPS there, but ultimately she's not going to be a very strong anti aircraft boat. I definitely don't recommend specking into any aircraft with her. She has a 36.8 knot top speed. However, caveat emptor, that is going to be with the speed flag. It is 35 knots even without it. And the turning circle is 640 meters, which is quite good for a destroyer. And two and a half second rudder shift time, which is a very short. And you will see here when we get to the upgrades... This is one of the few destroyers you don't necessarily need to take the rudder shift module on. Her concealment range is 6.1 kilometers, and that is going to be with concealment expert on the captain. And her detection range by air is 3.4 kilometers. So still relatively stealthy, even though we lost that tier 8 concealment systems mod 1. It's frustrating, but ultimately the ship does have some other positives to go with it. In terms of our upgrade modules, Main Armaments Mod 1, that's become a standard here. Aiming Systems Mod 1, also becoming a standard here. Again, I just don't see AA Guns Mod 2 being a viable build. There's some of you going, well, the main batteries turn like glaciers, so why don't we get Main Battery Mod 2? The reduction in the reload time, I just don't think it's worth it. And even if you get basic firing training to offset it, you're not gaining the benefits of what you would have without it. There are ways to use the guns on this ship to engage destroyers and stuff that don't require you to constantly be traversing your turrets. And those are the methods I recommend. So I'm sticking to Aiming Systems Mod 1. Uh, that's the one I feel is the most viable. Propulsion Systems Mod 1 or Steering Gears Mod 1. It's your pick. Personally, I find the Propulsion Systems Mod 1 to be a much bigger hindrance than losing my steering. With Last Stand, you always have the ability to steer. And while it's reduced, it's not nearly as big of a deal to lose 
that than it is to lose the ability to actually physically escape from the destroyers that are chasing you. In this last slot, Propulsion Systems Mod 1 is really the only one of these three that I recommend. Uh, and that's going to decrease the time it takes to get to full power. And it increases engine power when the ship starts moving. Basically, between negative six knots and positive six knots, it increases how fast you get to those directions. So if you're going in reverse from a stop, uh, it increases. And it decreases the time it takes you to get it to negative six knots. So it increases your speed in reverse. It increases your speed in while going forward up to six or negative six knots. So it doesn't help beyond that, but it helps you like if you're sitting in smoke shooting at stuff, you can really move back and forth inside your smoke far easier. And if you see torpedoes coming in your smoke, you can evade them far easier. Anyway, uh, we will cover some more of the topics in this in our battle video. So let's get rolling to it. All right, so we are going to be in a Tier 6 fight that has two aircraft carriers in it on each side, a Tier 6 and a Tier 5. Our side has a Ryojo and a Bogue. They have an Independence and a Zuiho. And, well, yeah. I mean, overall, teams seem pretty well balanced. They've got an extra Destroyer, and we've got an extra Cruiser. Not a terrible trade, in my opinion. On this map, especially with the caps, uh, you know, it frequently devolves into this kind of mess over B. And uh, I don't know of any other way to, <laughs> to really state this, but this map it really only has one viable strategy, and that's A, B. C always devolves into this, who can die there quicker? It's so easy to shut down with torpedoes. It's so easy to shut down by parking battleships on either end. It's just not worth going to C until the very end unless they just completely ignore it. I'm all the way over here by A anyway, so we're just going to go into A. And my goal for this map is not so much to be... Oh... I'm not going to play this ship like a Minikaze. Now, if you remember, Minikaze was really, really strong when it was sent charging into the battle. And this ship isn't quite as strong in that role. You can still do it in certain limited s situations, but uh, you know it's you're a lot more limited in it because the ship is a much larger ship, and as a result, you tend to take hits more frequently. And when you do you're wide enough that sometimes battleship shells really hurt or AP from cruisers really hurts and it doesn't work out terribly well for you. So we're going to A and as I've said with the previous videos on Japanese destroyers, when you go to a cap point, always, 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 always have a plan of escape. They have three destroyers, two of them are in a division, a Clemson and a Kamikaze, which means those two are probably going to operate together. I know they spawn together, so there's a good chance that they're going to be operating together. A Clemson will absolutely wreck this thing's face in a gunfight if it gets the opportunity to do so with any form of support. And the Kamikaze, it's a sneaky son of a gun. So it's very difficult to fight those two ships, especially when they're together. Thankfully, I've got air cover, and I've seen kind of... Well, you'll see here in a minute. There you can see their whole fleet is going to B, C. And this is probably the single best example of the reasons why we don't go to B or C. Now, they do have two carriers, and I'm going to sit on this far side of A over here. That way, if necessary, I can bail out, get out of any combat situation that I'm in. And meanwhile, while I'm doing that, I'm chatting with one of our teammates who is a viewer. So, uh, Road Rider, I, I was um, I, I was glad that this ended up being a really good good battle for me so I could use it. I always like putting you guys in videos if I can. And so this was a pretty good battle video, and I, I figured we'll, we'll go ahead and use it. And it shows exactly what I wanted it to show. Uh, we got this Karnik up here that, um, you know, he, he's going the other way. He looks like he's alone. So we'll, we'll go up there and we'll see what we can get out of this. Um Chances are we're going to run into either aircraft are going to spot us or their destroyers are going to spot us. So we will see which one it ends up being. Well, I can pretty much guarantee you it's going to be the, that aircraft. Well, maybe not. Yep, there it is. Okay. And, of course, emerald torpedoes from behind. <laughs> There's a torpedo indicator. Turn around and look. Yep, there they are. 
Don't know what he's shooting at. Don't care. Um, definitely should probably go watch my how to play video on the Emerald. So he knows that those torpedoes are short enough range that he's not going to hit anything with them. In fact, they should be dying here pretty soon. And so we are going to go ahead and we're going to keep going over there. You see, I noticed I turn on my AA there real briefly after I got detected by aircraft. Uh, it was enough to get the carrier to go away and, and shoo. We're going to duck through this gap here in the island and see what we can see over in B. Uh, I'm also going to see if I can't provide any smoke or if it's even necessary to provide smoke. Because right now it's really not necessary to provide smoke. Uh, most of their ships aren't, aren't spotted. The one ship that is spotted that's in range of our ships coming through that gap... He's a one battleship. It's two battleships and a cruiser that's coming through there. If they can't handle that, then I don't know what to say. Unfortunately, this island here blocks all my fun and makes it so I can't engage the Koenig here. And grr. <laughs> we'll just say grr. Um, so we got to wait. We'll just keep going over to B. We've, we're giving ourselves plenty of gap here. Our guns are turned towards the direction that we're most likely to receive contact from with regards to the other destroyers. If I remember correctly, the two remaining destroyers are, are the, the Kamikaze and the... Oh, there's their Zuiho. Are the Kamikaze and the Clemson, and I believe they are with this Koenig, so... Uh, chances are they are over by me. That's just a little bit of map sense and a little bit of, of understanding how divisions usually work. Unfortunately, that Koenig turns away. You can see that on the minimap, and we are detected, which means there is a Kamikaze near us. We are going to launch torpedoes, and we're going to launch a wide spreads just to kind of get him to panic maneuver, and, and hopefully we can get some help here. Uh, you can see he's hit me. We're going to exchange some gunfire here. One thing that you... Look at that. Okay, so 11... Almost 1,200 damage, but... Uh, Koenig, that really hurt. When you guys are getting into these fights, unless you're going to break contact really fast, and it like you, you're just a fleeting contact with each other, like he barely pops into 6.1 and then turns out and loses detection right away. It's not worth engaging in those cases, but when you're spotted at relatively close range and you know you're going to be detected for a while, you might as well begin engaging. Now, our aircraft have spotted both their destroyers. Look at how close we were to actually getting one of these guys. Holy cow. That was a pretty good torpedo spread. Um... So we are now in B, and we are capping B pretty much uncontested. We've got a New York coming around the island here, and maybe we can get some torpedoes off on him. So we're going to traverse our guns the other way because our battleships and cruisers are coming up between A and B, and I want to have some form of ability to get to them to deploy smoke because with this battleship here, you just never know what's going to happen. Now, you'll notice I'm watching these basically one right at, one ahead, and one behind, but I'm overlapping them by a half. And the reason for that is simple. Uh, this New York seems to not have any desire to change direction. And so we will punish him for that. And it does require a little bit of luck because all it's going to take is one aircraft. Ouch, that hurt. One aircraft to spot one of those torpedoes, and he's going to slow down or speed up. Thankfully, this does not occur. There's the New York. We're going to... Maybe we can draw a fire. I, I don't know why. Well, you know, we're, we're, we're launching at him just in case we actually get some kills. Three torpedo hits and a dev strike. 35,000 damage. We're already up and over the uh, server average damage for this ship. Um, we still have two other battleships in this area. We have two destroyers in this area as well. We need to be cognizant of their location. We are currently um, doing quite a lot to their team and hurting them. I've taken out the engines on this Clemson, and that's a good sign. It, it, it appears to me that he is not running last stand. Interesting thing to note. If they're not going to run last stand, they will die relatively easily because they're unable to get away. And you'll see that over at sea, their, their forces, they lost one ship over there. We just lost our first ship. And he died over in C as well. And that's unfortunate, but when you think about it, we've managed to kill four of theirs for one loss. So the guys that are over at C, that, that destroyer that's operating over there, doing a very good job of harassing those ships 
and killing them. And we also have a cruiser, and there's also a battleship over there, if I remember correctly, on the, from the minimap. We are going to go ahead, and we're going to try and head over towards sea. There was a number of battleships over there that I, f I need to get engaged. There is also two of their carriers that I would also like to engage. And it just, sometimes you get lucky and the carriers are real close. Sometimes you're not lucky and the carriers aren't close. So we're going to go over there anyway. We're going to see what happens. We might get lucky and get some. Of course, this also comes with the added downside of the fact that their aircraft are still hovering around, which means hitting any ships over here will be more difficult, which means we need to use far smarter senses when it comes to launching our torpedoes. We can't just do like what we did with that New York when we nuked him from full health, or not full health, from three quarters health. We need to actually do a little bit more pre-planning. And I realize that I keep saying this, but I'm eventually going to get to that torpedo guide to, to really tell you how it's going to work. And we'll talk a little bit more about it as we get over there because we will end up torpedoing yet another target. Now, as we come around this corner, important to note, they still have Kamikaze, they still have Clemson. Both of those ships, you can see the Kamikaze is all the way over to the west, unknown where the Clemson is. I can only imagine he's hovering probably in the direction that I'm going because... You know, that's what a good, smart gunboat DD is going to do, and we detect him before he detects me. I get detected by aircraft. We're going to go ahead and pop some shots off at Mr. Clemson here. He is lower than me in terms of tiers, but he is a much more powerful destroyer when it comes to the gunnery play, especially if he's got those upgraded forged guns. He has eight of them that he can bring to bear. We, you can see we are still doing quite a good bit of damage enough to cause him to turn away. Now, their carrier is really pissed at me because I exist and I'm coming to mess with their day. We go ahead and we select their torpedo bombers. They are way off in that, but we managed to get a shot, a shoot down, and we are still doing damage to this Clemson. So we are working our way and we are getting some pretty good damage off on him. Unfortunately, we are now exposed to a New Mexico and somewhere over there is a cruiser. I think he's in the sea now. And here comes more torpedo bombers. Um, talk about really putting a cramp in your style. I mean, this one, oh, he's, you can see he's setting it up to cross drop. And unfortunately, without, we shot down another one, without the addition of, of uh, our advanced firing training, we don't have the range to engage that uh, the independence that's over there. And he tries to cross drop. He misses the first one because he deployed it too late. We end up taking a huge amount of damage from that New Mexico. He's such a jerk. Um, and successfully dodged the second set. Now this New Mexico, he's still shooting at us. I wanted to get a little bit closer because as soon as these aircraft disappear from the, our air detect range, we're going to disappear again for at least a little bit. So we turn off our AA again here pretty soon. Oh, we go stealth. We're going to go ahead and deploy our smoke. And you can see we've taken some damage. New Mexico, why aren't you maneuvering? We're not detected. We're not currently in our smoke. But, you know, he's not. He's, he's maneuvering a little bit, but not enough for me to really feel like he's going to evade a whole bunch of these. And in hindsight, I should have launched him just that first set just a little bit further ahead, and we probably would have killed him with this out. Man, they're looking good, though. And I'm sitting here thinking, oh, look at that. All it's going to take is for him to move. And I, I was praying we could get him to turn in just a little bit or slow down something so that these would hit. Uh row, Scooby. Yep. And you can tell I was thinking that those were all going to hit. Unfortunately, we're only going to get the two. And so we are up to 60,000 damage at this point. New Mexico is coming in hot and heavy, so we're going to back up. Remember, the base detection range is right around two to two and a half kilometers, and he only has to get within that, and then I am spotted. So as so long as the smoke is still here, we are good to go. He's been starting on fire with somebody else. 14 seconds until torpedoes are up. I've got... <laughs> Road is asking for me to, to launch torpedoes. Like, I already did, man. They're on cooldown. Five seconds to go. You can see they come up. Look, whoa, crap. And, and <laughs> Aoba is right there, too. Well, we're going to go ahead and launch torpedoes. Now, you'll see I'm launching again. One ahead, one slightly behind. And this one I'm going to hold on to because I'm pretty sure that those are going to hit him. So we're going to launch one relatively in the same area, but at the Aoba. 
We've got 78,000 damage, 79,000, basically 79,000 damage, and the game ends. I was like, oh, we were so close to seeing if we could maybe get a double strike on this. 79,352 damage. That dev strike helped out a lot. 1,636 base XP, three aircraft kills. There's the detailed report in the credits and XP screen. I really like Fubuki. She always seems to try her best, but ultimately I just can't get around the fact that they took away that that middle turret. I want that turret back, and I'll get it back when we get to Akatsuki, but it's just not the same without it. If you're looking for more tips on how to do torpedo stuff, check out some of my other epic battle videos with the various Japanese destroyers that have three launchers on them, Shimakaze, uh, Minakaze and Fubuki. Like, comment, subscribe if you haven't already, and thank you for watching.